I was an eight-year-old boy. One day I made a mistake which I did not consider something bad, nor have I thought so to this day. My sister admonished me and took me to the parishioner so that he could correct me and punish me. I confessed my sin to the priest, and after harshly reprimanding me, he made me kneel down in the middle of the church. Deeply saddened, I wondered within myself why treat so severely a child for such a slight fault? When I get big, I want to be a religious person, a confessor, and treat the souls of sinners with much goodness and mercy. This episode that Father Leopoldo of Castelnuovo still remembered so clearly years later, took place right here in the parish church of Herzginovi in Castelnuovo di Kotor, the small town in ex-Yugoslavia where he was born. At that time, the future saint's name was still Adiodato Giovanni Mandic, meaning God-given. This name was most likely a prophetic vision of his life. My relationship with Father Leopoldo goes all the way back to when I was 19. I was still a student here in Padua. Needless to say, I'm now 83. I clearly remember that day in May, after dinner, Father Leopoldo entertained me and the other students. He talked and talked to the point that almost all of us were amazed. At a certain point, he said, this nation, Italy, will become a sea of fire and blood, and this friary will be destroyed along with the church. But my confessional will be spared as a monument to God's mercy. We're now in this room where you can still feel the compassion of Christ that Father Leopoldo placed in our hearts. Father Leopoldo was hospitable in this room. He received all penitents with a smile. But in particular, he blessed everyone with his goodness, his gentleness and his generosity. He always left a great sense of peace and serenity in people's hearts. Castelnuovo is, like it was then, a small town on the southern coast of Dalmatia, exactly in front of the Gulf of Koto. Once belonging to the Venetian Republic, at the time it was part of the Austrian Empire, which eventually became the Republic of Montenegro of today. When St. Leopoldo was born on May the 12th, 1866, Castelnuovo was still in Austrian territory, and only in 1918 did it become Yugoslavia. The population today prevalently follows the Orthodox religion, but a minority of Catholics have always remained fervent worshippers. The family of St. Leopold belonged to that minority. Little Bogdan, Adeodato's name in Croatian, was the second to last of 12 siblings in the Mandic family. His health was so frail and precarious that his christening was postponed for a month. 
The Mandich were traders and owned a fleet of fishing and freight ships. This was their home. The family was well off at one time, but the economic crash reduced the family to miserable conditions. Poverty was hard, yet the family never lost its dignity, as Father Leopoldo recalled later. In his late years, he confided this to one of his desperate penitents, who he knew was struck by the same hostile fate. I understand your terrible sadness. You see, even my family was once wealthy and we too lost everything we had to the point of destitution. I've shared your same experience, and for this reason, I know the pain you feel. Here is what remains of the small Capuchin friary that Father Leopoldo attended as a young man. The church dates back to the 1600s under the Venetian Republic. It was built for the religious support of its soldiers stationed in Castelnuovo and the city of Coto. When the Serenissima Republic fell, the Veneto friars remained here until 1903 to keep the Catholic community alive in the area. The young boy, Adiodato, admired the friars' steadfast faith and their simple, peaceful life. When his desire to consecrate himself to God was clear once and for all, theirs was the example he chose to follow. His first stop was in the Francescan seminary at Udine. Adiodato Mandic was 16 years old. This is where he finished his high school education. His health was still frail, and his speech was impeded by a slight stutter. From here, in 1882, he departed for the friary in Bassano del Grappa for his year of novitate. This year of novitate is a year of trials and spiritual growth that all Francescan Capuchin monks are required to do before the profession of their simple vows. This is followed by another three years dedicated to the commitment to their vows of obedience, poverty, and chastity. And it's right here in this garden chapel, after his year of novitate, that Brother Leopoldo made his profession. Brother Leopoldo is no longer Adiodato Mandic. A few days after his arrival, once again in the same chapel, he gave up his Christian first name and his family last name to become Brother Leopoldo of Castelnuovo and put on the habit of a Capuchin monk. And finally, in May 1885, at the age of 19, Brother Leopold arrived for the first time in Padua, the city that would eventually become his second home. It's here, in the church of Santa Croce, that the future saint would make his solemn profession of the religious vows and become a Franciscan Capuchin friar. Since then, many years have passed, and naturally the church and friary are nothing like what they once were. Here it is in an old photograph, before the church was destroyed by the Allied forces in an air raid on May the 14th, 1944. After his solemn profession, Brother Leopold was transferred again. This time, the superiors sent him to Venice to pursue his studies. On the island of Judaica, there was a friary, the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer. His theological studies prepared him for priesthood. Father Leopoldo was finally ordained in September 1890, at 24 years of age, in the splendid Basilica della Salute, by the Cardinal Patriarch of Venice himself. In that moment of great joy, the inevitable absence of his parents was painful to say the least. Due to the family's dire economic means, they could not be there for his ordination. Nevertheless, just days before, he received two loving letters. One was personally written by his mother, Karolina Zarevich. Dearest son, I cannot describe the joy and happiness in receiving your beloved letter. My motherly heart is deeply comforted, knowing that the happiest day of my life is about to come, the day that my beloved son will celebrate the Holy Mass. The other letter was written by his father, Pietro Antonio Mandic, on behalf of himself and the entire family. 
Only one thing deeply saddens me, the fact that I cannot be there in person for your sacrifice. But you can be certain that we will be with you in heart and mind. Your mother and I gladly give you our family blessing, and as a priest, we kiss your holy hand, asking you to always keep us in mind and send us your blessings. This is the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer on the island of Judeca, one of the most suggestive places in Venice. By now, he's no longer Brother Leopoldo, but will always be known as Father Leopoldo. Here, he'll remain for another seven years after ordination. First, to continue his studies in theology, and second, to begin his religious pastoral studies as a confessor and preacher. But then, in 1897, a new transfer seemed to fulfill the desire that Father Leopoldo always had in his heart. He sent back to Eastern Europe among his beloved people. The ancient Capuchin church sanctuary was one of the most noteworthy constructions in Zara. Zara was a beautiful city founded by the Romans that became an outpost for the Venetian Republic on the Adriatic coast. Following Father Leopold's footsteps, we're now back in Zadar in Dalmatia, which is further north in respect to Castelmolo di Cotto, a zone where the Republic of Croatia lies today. At the high altar, there's a painting dedicated to Our Lady of Miracles that's been venerated in this sanctuary for centuries. Here, Father Leopoldo was finally able to draw closer to his people and to the Orient. He felt it was his mission to promulgate unity between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Christians in his place of birth. Father Leopoldo used to say this about himself. I'm the fruit of a population that does not see things the way we do, but I live for them just the same. Croatian in origin and citizen of Austria, Father Leopoldo's nationality was always an issue he took to heart. He was deeply attached to his land and its people and shared their concerns. It wasn't sentimentalism, nor was it nationalism. Just as he once wrote, it was God's calling. By God's grace, it's now perfectly clear what I was called for to do for the salvation of my people. I must pray and help bring the dissidents of this land back to the Catholic Church. But God's plan was far more mysterious. It was not Father Leopold's physical presence in Zara that would have brought about religious unity and the spiritual growth of his people. As a matter of fact, only three years as superior in the small friary of Zara, Father Leopoldo was transferred once again to Italy. His first stay was in Bassano del Grappa as a confessor. Five years later, he was back in the Austrian Empire, this time as a vicar in the friary of Capodistria in today's Slovenia. He spent just over a year there and was soon sent to northern Italy in a town called Tieni in the Friday sanctuary of Madonna dell'Olmo. The next year he was moved to Padua, only to be sent back to Tieni. This time only for eight months because on the 25th of April 1909, at the age of 43, he was once again in Padua. Here in the Friary of Santa Croce, he was the director of the Young Capuchin Scholars where he also taught petrology. Later he was exonerated from these positions so he could dedicate himself entirely to confessions. At the outbreak of World War I, the Italian government, for security reasons, ordered all citizens of Istria and Dalmatia to be held prisoners, except those who accept to become Italian citizens. Father Leopoldo, who prefers to keep his Austrian citizenship, accepts to be transferred to southern Italy. His first two years was in the Friary of Torre, then to Nola near Naples, and finally in Arienzo, another town in southern Italy near Caserta. Once the war was over, Leopoldo finally moved back to Padua. He resumed his position in his small confessional cell and recommended his long procession of penitents. Believers of every age and every walk in his life came for his understanding, his compassion, 
an absolution given in God's name. But he was still moved by the voice in his heart, beckoning him to his land, asking him to dedicate his life to his people. Once again it appears that his dream is about to be fulfilled. When in 1921, after the occupation of D'Annunzio and his legionnaires, Fiume is annexed to Italy. The Capuchin Frari, which was once in Istria, is now part of Veneto, a northern Italian province. In 1923, Father Leopoldo was transferred to Fiume. The saint was ecstatic. He could finally be with his people. Now he could dedicate his life to his mission of restoring unity in the Christian Church. But once again things were not as they seem. This time the entire city of Padova is against him. It was nearly unanimous and only a few days after Father Leopoldo's departure, the bishop asked the provincial father of the Capuchin monks in the name of the citizens to give the citizens of Padova back their confessor. Upon that, the provincial father wrote to Father Leopoldo, I have no choice but to take back my decision regarding your vocation and call you back to Padua. You are highly requested by prominent people as well as devout religious followers. This goes to say that you have done a mountain of good, as the bishop said, and that your mission in Padua is not yet complete. So Father Leopoldo returned to his confessional cell where he received, listened to, comforted and absolved penitents each day, even 12 hours non-stop. He resumed the daily Mass and the celebration of the Eucharist, but he finally committed himself to his dream of unity in the Church. May there be only one fold with only one shepherd. And this was the sacrifice that he offered toward the return of the Eastern Church to the Catholic Church. A martyrdom that would continue day after day, non-stop for more than 20 years. It's been said that not everyone liked Father Leopoldo for his laxness. Some accused him of being overindulgent. He suffered because of the things that were said about him. But filled with the wealth of God's Spirit, he pointed to the cross and said, if the Holy Cross must rebuke me for being overindulgent, I could only say, Blessed Father, you are the one who gave me this example, and I'm not indulgent to the point of dying for souls. At the end of autumn 1940, Father Leopoldo's health began to diminish, and from there only got worse. At the beginning of April 1942, he was recovered in the city hospital. He ignored the tumor in his esophagus and soon went back to the friary to continue his confessions. July 29th, he held confessions without stopping. Then after an entire night of prayer, he began preparations for the daily mass when he suddenly lost consciousness. He was taken to his bed and was given the Holy Sacraments for his illness. He uttered the last words of the Salve Regina and reached up as if he knew someone was awaiting him. At this point, he took his last breath and departed. Father Leopoldo of Castelnuovo, formerly Adiodato Giovanni Mandic, died on July the 30th, 1942. The war was raging that would eventually destroy Padua's Capuchin Frari and miraculously leave his confessional unscathed. Soon there was talk of miracles. Already in 1946, the bishop's see in Padua initiated an informative process regarding the virtues and public hearsay about Father Leopoldo's sanctity. First, by the Vox Populi, and later the Church, recognized two charismas in our saint. One was his excellence in administering confessions. The other was his complete devotion to the reunification of the Orthodox and the Catholic Churches. In addition to this, there have been miraculous recoveries attributable to his intercession. 
This fact has been given recognition by ecclesiastical authorities who've elevated Father Leopoldo Mandic to the honors of the altar. To these authorities obtained his beatification, despite the arduous procedures of sanctification. The third instead advocated his permanent insertion in the canon of saints, in other words, canonization. There were two miracles that contributed to his beatification. The first was Elsa Raimondi, who was 26 years old when she was diagnosed with a serious form of tubercular peritonitis. She was recovered in the hospital of Lendinara on April the 16th, 1946. The doctors performed an exploratory operation, but they were forced to stop immediately, declaring her inoperable. This was the period right after the war. The same ailment that could be cured with antibiotics today deteriorated to the point that the young woman was nearly dying. On July the 30th, the anniversary of Father Leopoldo's death, Elsa's parish priest brought her a relic and biography of the Capuchin. The same day Elsa began a novena with her family, which she continued until the 12th of September, when she miraculously healed and all her symptoms unexpectedly disappeared. There was no longer a single sign that she'd been so ill. A miraculous and permanent recovery, as medical experts certified in 1951. This was redeclared in 1965 as a premise for Father Leopoldo's beatification. The second miracle that was acknowledged toward Father Leopoldo's beatification took place in March 1962. The story takes place when the 60-year-old Paolo Castelli from Merate, Lecco, started feeling sharp pains in his lower abdomen. He was taken to the emergency room and after opening his peritoneum, they discovered a massive infarct of the mesentery due to thrombosis of the mesenteric vessels, including a part of the small intestine. A lesion so severe and widespread that the doctors had to forego any sort of surgery. The only prognosis, in fact, was death. The patient was in stationary critical condition for three days until the fourth night, March the 8th when he had a violent attack. It was one o'clock in the morning, and his wife, votary of Father Leopoldo, was at his side. Before the operation, she sewed a medal onto her husband's shirt and continually prayed to Saint Leopoldo, imploring her husband's recovery. When her husband declared that he was about to die, his wife responded, no, you aren't going to die, because Father Leopoldo is going to heal you. Just then, her husband lost consciousness for a few minutes, only to wake up later with no more signs of illness. The doctors confirmed an instant miraculous recovery with no further relapses. A miraculous recovery, as the ecclesiastical experts declare, solely attributable to the intercession of Father Leopoldo. That's why in 1976, Pope Paul VI in St. Peter's Square in Rome proclaimed the beatitude of Father Leopoldo Mandic, elevating him to the honors of the altars. Who is he? Who is the man? whose blessed name gathers us here today to celebrate this irradiation of Christ's gospel. Take a good look. It's a poor little capuchin friar with the eyes of a Franciscan. Do you see him? Are you trembling? Who did you see? Yes. Let's say it's a weak servant of the people and yet an authentic image of Christ. 
So, once again, who is this man? It's Father Leopoldo. That's right, the servant of God, Father Leopoldo of Castelnuovo. Here in Padua, in the Santa Croce Sanctuary, in this marble tomb, so much larger than the minute Capuchin friar, lie the remains of Sant Leopoldo Mandic. Yes, saint, because just seven years after his beatification, the Church officially recognized that other miracles took place with the intercession of Blessed Leopoldo. To pass from beatification to the Church's official list of venerable saints, a new canonical process must be initiated to recognize a miraculous event that takes place with their saintly intercession after beatification. For the canonization of Saint Leopoldo, the event that was examined and recognized as his saintly intercession was the miraculous recovery of Elisabetta Pensolotto on March the 29th, 1977. Elisabetta was 57 years old with a long history of hospitalization when she was recovered in the Arla City Hospital in Trento, Italy for severe heart problems. For 27 days, the patient was in excruciating pain. On the 27th evening, the patient's leg was so swollen and discolored that it looked like a block of marble. The pain continued to get worse. Previous therapy prevented blockage of the femoral artery, but now the effect wore off. By now the artery was completely closed. The 28th evening the situation got even worse, and I called the head physician. He came to our room and took a look at her leg and ordered immediate surgery, otherwise she would not make it another day. Elizabeth refused to be operated on and told them that they could do what they needed to do the next morning. The following day at six in the morning, the nurse told me to come down and let my wife tell me the good news. How is the pain? It's all gone. What do you mean it's all gone? And I pulled down the sheets to look. Now, I must say that at the time I'd been in the medical profession for 34 years, but I was nevertheless amazed. The leg I saw was not at all a sick leg. There was absolutely no trace of gangrene forming. So what happened? And she replied, oh, nothing. A friar came into my room. You know, that little one. And what did he say? She said, nothing. He just walked around my bed and looked at me. Then he smiled and said, Elisabetta, don't worry, they're not going to cut off your leg. Even in this case, her recovery was instantaneous, complete and unexplainable. This was reconfirmed four years after the original medical examination, when the apostolic process was in course. And so, one Sunday morning on October the 16th, 1983, Pope John Paul II, in St. Peter's Square, proclaimed his sainthood and listed the name St. Leopoldo Mandic in the Canon of Saints, and he did so exalting him with these words. In the end, what vestiges did St. Leopoldo inherit? Who and what did he live for? He inherited all the brothers and sisters that lost God, along with any love and hope. Poor men and women who needed God. The God they invoked, imploring his forgiveness, his comfort, his peace and serenity. St. Leopoldo's message is still alive, today more than ever. Faith, faith, have faith, is vital for us today too. His face still infuses trust and strength. His protection is more efficient than ever for all those who turn to him. <laughs>